We're here today with Dr. Gumushkaya, a late researcher from the Anthro Boss team at Thompson University. Good afternoon, Dr. Gumushkaya. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, good morning, your time. Good evening, my time. Uh, thanks for having me. To kick things off, could you provide our viewers with a succinct overview of your research and shed light on why it holds such significance? Sure. So um, with Anthrobots, we wanted to probe this idea of can we create completely new biological structures by leveraging the sort of computational uh, nature of biological structures um, to create type of living architectures that are not found in nature, that are not produced by evolution, but that are designed by us humans for purposes that might be useful in medicine or in uh, environmental remediation um, or in creating new type of drugs or synthesizing new type of materials. So we are seeing this as a programmable platform that would do essentially, ultimately, whatever you want it to do. Um, and as an exemplary uh, application, we showed that these bots can sort of crawl in uh, damaged human tissue in 2D and uh, induce repair of scratch neuronal cells in the course of three days. I appreciate that insight. Now, bring the discussion to the present. Could you update our audience on the current stage of your research and offer a glimpse into the next steps and upcoming plans? Uh, there is a novelty both in terms of how we manufacture these bots and also um, in terms of what they can do. So in terms of how we manuf manufacture these bots, when you look at the field of synthetic morphogenesis, which is this field where scientists are trying to create completely new, as I um, sort of introduced, biological structures, they have so far been manufactured using exogenous genetic circuits, meaning um, transgenes by creating genetically modified organisms. Uh, however, in our research, we were able to leverage the native um, sort of abilities of these human cells from the trachea to form new structures. So that enabled us to essentially create a new synthetic morphogenesis method that relies on leveraging morphogenetic plasticity. But at the same time, in the uh, on the applicational front, it enabled us to create synthetic organisms uh, or constructs, however when I call them, that have a new form but do not carry exogenous DNA that do not belong in um, the human body. So uh, in other words, what we can do um, thanks to this feature of the Anthrobots is that we're planning to um, take cells from a human patient's like, skin and uh, using those cells from that donor, um, create Anthrobots that are specific to that patient and then put that back in the patient's body. And um, as a result of that, the body would not, at the subsectoring hypothesis, trigger an immune system or any kind of inflammatory response because even though the Biobot is a new synthetic construct, the DNA is 100% same as that donor. So um, in terms of exogenous uh, Biobots being sort of put into human body, any type of work in that space, um, this is the first um, sort of application where um, a human DNA is not altered and um, sort of faithfully preserved. Intriguing. And looking forward, what potential applications do you anticipate emerging from your research in the future? Sure. So as I mentioned, biobots can be used for a variety of different things with anthrobots specifically because we're focusing on manufacturing these bots from human cells. Naturally, we want to focus on more medical applications. So as mentioned, our first application, the first thing we've tackled was neuronal um, degeneration. But going forward, some of the things we are hoping to start looking at is to explore what other types of things these biobots can do. For example, can we deploy them in um, arteries to have them clear plate? Or can we uh, program them to put them into, say, the, the human gut to chase certain pathogens or bacteria? Or can we um, use them as these sort of patrol agents that would um, circulate in an area to find potential sort of early onset markers of tumor formation. Um, those are sort of the first set of things we want to try and then from, from there, based on what we see, we'll, um, we have a few more things in mind. That certainly holds promise. And on a practical note, is there a potential for your research to be applied in treating challenging diseases such as cancer, paralysis, or facilitating the healing of damaged brain cells? Right, so we're at the very, very beginning of trying to answer that question. 
Um, what we see so far in vitro in the lab it, it is promising. So one of the things we do want to try next is to create um, disease models that are better proxies for, like you mentioned, uh, certain neurodegenerative diseases like paralysis, stroke, um, even ALS, Alzheimer's, or other sort of cortical, like brain-related um, injuries. So we have not tested specific disease models for any of these illnesses yet, but that's what we want to try next to see if anthrobots can uh, give a similar sort of healing response in these contexts. And for cancer um, and other sort of tumor genesis in the body, uh, we do want to use them to sort of detect early formation. But what we're also interested in doing is if there is a known tumor in the body, uh, could we send these anthrobots to have them selectively target that tumorigenic tissue and sort of degrade the, the, the cancer cells while keeping the rest of the sort of tissue intact and untouched, which is one of the big challenges. Things like chemotherapy, uh, the non-specificity of it is what um, makes those therapies really challenging. So we're really hoping to um, start working, start adapting anthrobots for all of these applications. And now addressing concerns from our audience, how to respond to worries about the possibility of anthrobots becoming uncontrollable after being injected into human bodies? Are there specific safety measures in place? Yeah, so uh, what we've done in addition to making anthrobots is that we have observed how they die, how they disintegrate. So to this date, we have made thousands and thousands of them. And in every single case, each and every anthrobot disintegrated into individual cells. So there was never a case where a bot persisted for months and would just become sort of tumorigenic in the body or, or in, in the dish. Um, so that essentially um, helps us sort of create this uh, workflow where once the bot is inoculated into the body and does what it needs to do, it can either be extricated by humans, or even if we just leave it there, it would just degrade on its own naturally. And once it's degraded into individual cells, at that point it's not any different than the sort of dead cells in that patient's body that the body would get rid of anyway. Because again, as a reminder, anthrobot cells would carry the patient's DNA 100%, no new or exogenous genes are inserted. So for, for that reason, we are uh, not sort of terribly concerned, but of course, once we get to hopefully um, ex vivo or hopefully one day in vivo studies, we'll, that, that will be the first thing we'll test. Thank you for clarifying. And if there are plans for mass production, could you shed light on how that might impact the pricing of the technology? Also, what considerations are in place to ensure accessibility for the general public? Sure, so one of the uh, sort of wonderful things about anthrobots is that they build themselves. We are not going in there sculpting them or molding them or manually shaping them. We're starting with a single cell and that single cell proliferates and gives rise in the first of two weeks uh, to an anthrobot. So that the self-construction leveraging uh, a construction modality that is unique, you know, uniquely attributed to the natural structures, you know, think of a plant growing from seed. Uh, and bringing that into the manufacturing of synthetic structures is already really interesting intellectually because this is the first time we're leveraging synthetic, uh, we're leveraging self-construction and creation of synthetic human-made structures. But beyond that, what this also sort of practically enables us to do is to grow, again, hundreds of these bots in parallel because you're not going there and building them one by one, they're building themselves. You just set up the right conditions for them to um, sort of grow. So uh, thanks to that, mass fabrication and this like high throughput, achieving high throughput is really, really easy. Um, from a single vial of uh, sort of cells, we are able to get thousands of anthrobots. So mass fabrication, um, easy. Uh, in terms of accessibility, again, one of the uh, advantages with anthrobots not needing to um, have genetic engineering performed on them um, is that if once we are hopefully in the sort of clinical phase, um, we will just be able to take a skin sample or a cheek swab from a patient. And in the course of few, after a you know, few, few weeks, that patient will be able to have their own anthrobot. So in terms of, and, and that essentially is a um, sort of low cost um, workflow because there is no customization. 
the customization is inherent in that we're taking the DNA from the sample, but then we, uh, from the patient, but we don't need to add any extra DNA that needs to be, or any other material that needs to be customized to each patient. So we are able to sort of bring this customization and um, mass fabrication together, which will uh, what uh, sort of you know drive the price down uh, is our hope. Once we uh, sort of get more kind of clinically relevant data in the next steps of our research. Oh, that's really good news. And is there anything else you would like to share with us? Yeah, I mean it's a new technology. This was our first paper. Um, and I think one of the sort of, uh, you know, besides all these exciting applications, one of the things that Anthrobots, I'm hoping, will really drive sort of home the message that uh, nature, we are used to thinking of it as a static thing that's, you know, sitting outside waiting to be investigated by scientists. But uh, in reality, the, the morphogenetic code that's sort of um, enabling all these natural architectures in and around us to grow um, is a opportunity for us designers and scientists and engineers to get in there and sort of re-engineer that code, reprogram that code to uh, conceive of nature as a design medium for, you know, a lot of different applications that could help with some of the big challenges humanity is facing today. You know, medical problems is one face of it, but we also have other things like environmental sort of remediation issues or even global warming, like can we use biobots in general as, uh, for example, a carbon negative construction method to generate new materials. Um, or can we program them to sort of um, maybe like find and detect some of the pathogens or toxins in the environment that the traditional you know um, robots might not be able to? So um, the, the really opportunities are endless. So I do encourage the young minds to start thinking about synthetic biology and start thinking about how they might be able to adapt it to different problems that they are personally invested in. Very informative. That concludes our discussion for today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gumushkaya, for sharing these valuable insights with us. Thank you for having me and thanks for the great questions.